Our webinar topic today is risk management and resiliency in supply chains. Basically, we'll be exploring how companies are adapting to our fast changing business environment. So first, a quick introduction of our Axolytics team. I'm Chris Laudit, and with me here today are our supply chain subject matter experts, Matt Russell and Michael LaHood. Last week, we talked about the key differences between the agile and the lean supply chain planning philosophies. And this week, we wanna talk about supply chain resiliency and how companies are managing risks. I'm gonna review the basics. Then uh, after that, Matt will provide some specific, specific examples in Anaplan. And together with Michael, we'll discuss how companies use Anaplan to manage supply chain risks. So let's go ahead and jump in. The reason these practices are important is because it is critical in maintaining operational continuity and ensuring customer satisfaction and also safeguarding against unforeseen disruptions. Um, we've all seen what can happen as we've lived through several big supply chain hiccups since early in 2020 when we had the global pandemic. Can you remember how people were hoarding toilet paper and it was near impossible to find it on the store shelves? This is a good example of a disruption of a disruption uh, based on demand volatility. And so in addition, so there's other types of risks that we face in our supply chains. So yeah, demand volatility is one. Um, also supply disruptions, geopolitical factors, natural disasters, regulatory changes, and more. Um, if you remember during the COVID lockdowns in China, China being kind of a foundational piece to a lot of supply chains in a lot of different industries, those disruptions were propagated across the world and they were very, and they were very large. This is a you know, perfect example. And this topic is pretty apt for the times that we're living in today. Related to demand volatility being a big driver of supply chain risk, Funny story about Johnny Carson. Um, there was a Tonight Show episode back in the early 70s where Johnny Carson made a joke about there being not enough toilet paper. And it was a joke, but some people watching the TV show took it very seriously, thought it was true. And so they started hoarding up toilet paper. And we've seen this in the pandemic, the same exact thing happened. There was actually plenty of toilet paper, but as soon as people started seeing the empty shelves, it drove a behavior a behavioral change, which uh, made people want to buy more and more and hoard it up. And so even though there was never a, an actual demand that outstripped the supply, the, uh, the supply chains were disrupted as a result of just this, um, this consumer behavior. Um, and also, it's important to know, too, that the, that the, the risks that we face in, in supply chains, they're very diverse and they have cascading effects. Uh, on, the, on the entire supply chain. Uh, again, that, that example of China lockdowns causing consumer prices to go up on all kinds of products across the world. One of the other effects that came out of the pandemic is, uh, is about some, some countries are now actually, as a result of things that happen, are trying to deglobalize their supply chains. And some countries like in the United States, for example, are, doing, are having trends towards nearshoring. In other words, um, putting their manufacturing for their supply chains in closer to closer to uh, to home, as opposed to um, just anywhere where they might be, you know, where they might be able to build a, a an expensive factory in China, for example. So organizations they need to proactively identify and assess potential risks to their supply chains. There are several things they can do to do that. Uh, they can use methods such as risk mapping scenario analysis, and using historical data to identify vulnerabilities. But the first step and the most important thing is this proactive approach. So let's talk about some specifics. So there are many different specific things that companies do. And here's a, just a short list, including uh, dual sourcing, inventory optimization, diversification of suppliers, building strategic stockpiles. And these are just a few of the many things that are being done. But I think one of the best things a company can do is focus on collaboration and communication with suppliers and partners. And this will establish a mutually beneficial risk mitigation plan together. And that's the point. So the concept of supply chain resilience, it becomes more and more important and it involves the ability to adapt, recover and continue operations in the face of these disruptions. In order to accomplish that, businesses are building redundancy, flexibility and adaptability into the supply chain as key aspects of their resilience plan. So, of course, technology is a big part of this, like it always is. Um, there are a few different things that are 
kind of emerging or that are, that are being used today, um, including uh, advanced analytics, uh, AI, and Internet of Things. And these can all enhance supply chain and visibility and even better risk management and assessment. Um, but I think what's important is that some of these uh, methods are using real-time data. And for example, with Internet of Things, um, you can see where your inventory is in real time. And you can also even see the status of it. Like for example, if, if you've got a load on a, tr on a refrigerated truck, you've got a, a RFID in, your, in your, your cases, and you've got an Internet of Things appliance in that truck, you can even find out if anything happened to that inventory, if it was exposed to temperatures that would ruin the product, for example. And this gives you un unheard of visibility into where your inventory is and what its status is. Um, and companies are just now beginning to explore the advantages and, and where this can all go and, and what the opportunities are. So we need to emphasize the importance of strong relationships with suppliers and partners and managing the risks and building resilience, uh, utilizing collaborative efforts such as joint risk assessment, information sharing, and coordinated response planning helps to build strong, resilient supply chains. And there are companies out there that are doing that with their partners. It's, it's, it's beginning to, to take on more of an of a urgency, um, again, as a result of the things that we've seen going on in our economy and in geopolitical events in the last several years. There's some, some things in, uh, that are coming out in the future, like or starting to today already, uh, sustainable supply chain practices, um, blockchain technology for enhanced transparency, and the use of predictive analytics. I, I, I personally think blockchain technology is really a, a game changer. Um, it allows you to see pieces of inventory components throughout the whole process, even when they pass hands between different entities, different companies, and you're able to then still see where this thing was, what it was, what what it was exposed to, what where it is in, at any given point in time. And blockchain allows you to do that with a group of, of participating uh, entities across an entire business, across an entire industry. Also, there, there, are certain, there are companies who are doing carbon neutral manufacturing or using renewable energy sourcing to, to their plants, to their factories. Uh, a, a client I worked with had um, installed solar panels in their warehouse, overproduced electricity. They were able to generate more than they actually needed for their operations, which was uh, amazing. And, it's, and it represents, gives them a resiliency um, to when the power grid that they're normally connected to is fluctuating. So key, take key takeaways are emphasizing the ongoing and dynamic nature of, of supply chain risk management and their critical role it plays in maintaining operational stability and competitiveness. So that's the overview of what supply chain resiliency and risk management is. Uh, we're gonna now open it up to the panel and we're gonna look at some specific uh, examples of how, how you can use Anaplan to, uh, to manage your, your supply chain and, and to address these issues. So I'm gonna pass the share to Matt and Matt and Michael can begin doing their update or their overview of the, the demo part. Yeah, I think for me, watching Chris's presentation earlier and going back to our last week's discussion on lean versus agile, what's really been going through my head is the increased pressure or increased responsibilities that we're going to have to be placing on our sourcing organizations. So I started thinking, you know, we very seldom are, pro, you know, we get asked to do a supply planning implementation, uh, a demand planning implementation. Very few times that we come to with a work with a user story or, or a case where we need help for the sourcing group. But we've got a demo specifically built out for a sourcing group. And what I am sharing here is a fictional company called Halloway and their direct supply partners. This is an open bid quote or a request for a quote submission where we go ahead and as Halloway, we can post our forecast quantity. We can let them know what their last quote quantity was for us. We know their country of origin and we can give our suppliers access to be able to commit back, give us pricing back, 
and immediately flow that into our decision-making process. So instead of having to deal with quotes external and typing and doing and data entering in costs and F and, and terms and all that fun kind of stuff, Anaplane could do that for you. We've done this prior to the uptake of the agile or the resilient supply chain. Some of this is back to 2018, prior to 2020. Disruptions in risk management isn't just a post-COVID thing. You know, for those of us that have been in apparel, um, we very much remember Pakistani floods, which had disastrous impacts upon the cotton market worldwide. So it's, it's, this is these disruptions are not new, as, as the Johnny Carson story told. But now we begin to simplify the work for a sourcing organization. In this example, they can communicate back and forth with the supplier. The supplier has full access to this page with uh, where they can enter their comments as well and going back and forth. And of course, we remind them of the terms and conditions for quotation. So we get some legal jargon up here as well. Um, but all this makes sourcing easier and cleaner. Michael, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yes, Matt. So just for people who are new to Anaplan or thinking about getting Anaplan, if you allow a supplier or suppliers um, access to your Anaplan system for the supplier portal, would that count against their licensing? Would they lose employee licenses for their suppliers? Yes, it does require an Anaplan license to partner with your suppliers in this way. But I think as Chris highlighted, you know, the move is to more connected, uh, more transparent relationships across the supply chain. Um, so it, I think in the long term, it's worth that price of a, a seat at your Anaplan table to be able to have that communication. But it does indeed uh, require a seat with your license, uh, with your Anaplan solution. Understood. And now from a security perspective, would that supplier be locked into only seeing their bids? And how would we keep them from seeing another supplier's bid or seeing our process to determine which bid we're, we're going to accept? Yeah, the, the security in Anaplan is as up to date as any system that I've seen and as customizable as any system that I've seen. We can go right down to list members, list members being like this and take uh, direct, your direct supply partner login and give them read write access only to direct supply partners and no access to anybody else and no access to any other UX page. And we can build roles and specific UX pages, but we can really compartmentalize who sees what information as we begin to collaborate with other organizations and in terms of you know, just what, what makes sense and what's proprietary and all that fun kind of stuff. I wanted to jump to another dashboard on here. Um, in this instance, we're using an optimizer and we're, say, we're giving price 50% and supplier performance 50% weight on shafts. And we optimize our build allocation and we see it gives us uh, a more volume, right? We're highlighting that we're, we're increasing our overall volume um, by 104, but we're optimizing this and therefore we should be getting some cost savings. But these two grids are aligned. So you can look at our ba your baseline allocation is at 73,787. And, and now with this optimize, we've got more spend with direct su supplier partners. So live while we're managing our allocation and split, it's updating across any number of systems that we have uh, tied into here. Um, and really furthers that idea of connected planning. So the optimization process, is, is that optimizing each individual supplier or is it optimizing all suppliers together to figure out the best mix? This instance and what we're doing, if you put, if, for the way we've built this, it's our hat. So we're doing it for the best combination of price and supplier performance. So it's all the suppliers in one big bucket, optimize how I should order them to maximize my returns in terms of 
what I deem important. Is it possible to override the optimization process as part of our risk management policies? Um, for example, if Direct Supply Partners comes back after they've su submitted their bid and they have a disruption due to, say, a hurricane in Florida, um, can we wait the optimization or is it going to run and then we would have to do something at the back end of the optimization to adjust for that? In this instance, in this example that I'm showing you, it, it'll be a little bit different from when we touch the optimizer in a little bit. But in this instance, we're not taking into consideration the supplier capacity or any of those kind of things. So this isn't this place where we would be responding to, to that kind of downtime. That would be, you know, your next step down, down this path. Okay, thank you. And then finally, you know, one of the things that I think is always just to have your supplier scorecard automated for you, to be able to take this, output it into a PDF and send it to your supplier in terms of letting them know where they are or giving them insights. And here we're ranking them based on scores and spends and on-time delivery, and they get a grade and an overall customer grade. I get an immediate view of our year-to-date spend, what their on-time delivery is, what our purchase price variance is running with them. So this is, I get a snapshot of each supplier. And as, as a member of the sourcing organization, to have this at my fingertips for any conversation that I have with one of my supply base is such an advantage over, over guessing on how they're actually performing because very few organizations have the kind of detail where they can tell you right down to the supplier if they're putting it on their dock at the right time. And, and Matt, I, I think this kind of goes off the last question. So using this dashboard, if, if a supplier has a, say, a failing grade or a C or below, um, this is where we would go to our, our management group and say, you know, supplier X is that meeting our expectations. And, and this would be our driver for adjusting our supplier mix. This could be our driver for adjusting a supplier mix. It could be our driver to decide to go and qualify a new supplier as, as a replacement because one of them is no longer reliable. Um, it can be used for any number, any number of things along those lines. Excellent, thank you. The other thing, right, that we continue to talk about is a volatile demand or a volatile supply um, picture, which for the 70 years prior to COVID meant very simply that volatility we're going to try to absorb in our safety stock, right? That's the, if you think of your sawtooth, traditional sawtooth diagrams of supply, that buffer is if the supply takes longer to come in or if that demand comes down at a more sharp angle. But what I just so I want to I want to show with Anaplan is that we have, if you can dream of an inventory policy, we can create it for you in an Anaplan. In this one example, we can set our safety stock levels based upon DC service levels, based upon weeks of supply target, just based on forward-looking weeks of, of demand based on a target reorder. Anaplan really allows you to slice and dice your inventory, your inbound inventory, however it makes sense for you. And setting, I mean, if right now all your organization wants to do is plug in a thousand units to safety stock for your A items, Anaplan can 100% do that. If you're a traditional long-standing stood up company with very strict Apex definitions, and a plan can do that for you as well. It fits the entire solution um, from one to all. One of the reasons I wanted to come into this supply plan, uh, supply planning version is to show how quickly we can start having conversations within the organization when something goes wrong. And in my dream scenario, so I'm in a, in a DC fulfillment optimization record. Here's the baseline sourcing guidelines 
90% or it's coming from California for this DC, 10% of it's coming from Scotland, none of it's calling from Vietnam, but all regions adds up to 100%. Something happens. Uh, Kate Middleton wears William Wallace's tartan on national television and <laughs> the Scots rise up and all of a sudden the full UK is a full civil war. Right. And, and it's going it, to whatever our next thing is going to be something crazy that we can't think about. It might as well be as logical as that. So we can say, all right, we're going to pull all U.S. production. We're going to pull that into California because we know we have to zero Scotland. Netherlands, we're going to balance that out. We're going to go 50 percent from Vietnam. We're going to go 50 percent from the U.S. And once again, we're nothing from Scotland. Germany. Uh, Vietnam can take on some of that, but not all of that. So we're gonna we're gonna go 50-50 with Germany, like we did with Netherlands. And we're gonna to overcompensate, we're gonna take anything that we were building for APAC out of California and out of Scotland, and we're gonna push that all into Vietnam. And we're gonna say, oh, well, we're gonna give a tolerance, a sourcing tolerance of 15%. This is outrageous we've never seen it we're just going to authorize overtime and we're going to authorize outsourcing and we're going to call we're going to call this scenario the great scottish uprising of 23 <laughs> and we optimize our production allocation six steps the job runs up is running before us very quickly, right? So that's rescheduled everything. And now I've got a view here that lets me know right off the bat when I go into the organization that we've got a whole of, in this instance, 329 million of unfulfilled demands given the Scottish situation, right? And now you're talking about 10 minutes after the tweet. You're able to have that kind of conversation with upper management and begin to mitigate, mitigate your situation there. Michael, any thoughts on this one? In your baseline sourcing guides, is there a way to either have a warning or a trigger that would not that would allow you to not create a new uh, optimization scenario if all regions weren't 100%? Yeah, normally what uh how we like to approach that is is we would just normalize the percentage that's loaded. So if it was 130%, we would just normal it, normalize it down to 100. If it was 60%, we would normalize it up to 100 and just do that in the background. But certainly we can turn these red. We can stop the production, uh, optimize the production allocation completely if one of these don't equal 100 by using a simple Boolean in the background. So there's there's multiple ways we can pokey oak this uh, and make sure that uh, we don't screw up our allocation downstream. That's all the questions I've had on my end, and I do not see any open questions in the forum. Yeah, and that's that's all I got. I just want to touch a couple spots where, where Anaplan's already standing up in locations and being used for risk mitigation, but thank you. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That that was a really good um, demo. Just wanted to say uh, thank you to uh, anybody who's watching our webinar and uh, let you guys know that we've recently put a lot of content on um, in our in our website and also in YouTube. So and we're posting new new uh, multiple new webinars every week. So we've got some upcoming topics. We're going to do blockchain next week, and then after that. Uh, we're going to do some uh, deeper dive into supply chain analytics. So thanks again for joining us. Uh, have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you soon.